Good, thank you, Ryan Sylvia. I think I've got my title clear, but we'll, uh, <laughs> well, we'll see, won't we? Um, I do have the privilege this morning of continuing this series, Junctions on a Journey. Uh, actually, it's just been an excellent series, I think. I mean, I've been challenged by each talk. There's been encouragement in it. There's been some, something to get hold of of God. There's been things to work out in our lives. As we've looked at those moments of decision, those points of opportunity that we all have in our lives, those moments of decision that are going to move us either further forward in our faith or we take a step back, and equally those points of opportunity to either press into God or to step back. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you've not, uh, maybe you're just joining us for the first time this morning or there are weeks that you might have missed, you can go to our YouTube channel and just catch up with all of them. Uh, You're going to find a rich resource there uh, that's going to really encourage you in your faith. And what we're doing this morning is actually continuing straight on in the scriptures from where Matt Horner left us last week, uh, looking at the end of Exodus chapter 17. And the title this morning is Fighting in the Valley or Up on the Mountain. And so I'm going to read Exodus uh, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, and the text is going to be on the screen so you can follow. And then that gives us the, the setting for this morning. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So that's our scripture for this morning. But before we get into that, let's perhaps remind ourselves of where we are in this story of the Israelites. Well, they've been rescued uh, from slavery in Egypt, God's huge demonstration of power through the plagues, and through the passing of the Red Sea. And now they're traveling through a wilderness desert region. And we've heard in the last couple of weeks that they've been twice uh, miraculously provided with fresh water to drink in that desert region. And as Matt was sharing with us last week uh, from chapter 16, they've now also been miraculously provided with food. God's rescued them and continually he keeps demonstrating his power to them Um, in provision and in security. And today, as we pick up this story uh, with the Israelites still at Rephidim, which is where they were camped last week, which is now a place of uh, plentiful supply of water, we find it a completely different story. It's there that the Israelites are attacked by the Amalekites. So what's going on here? And what has provoked the Amalekites to attack the Israelites? Well, essentially, as far as the Amalekites were concerned, the Israelites were on their land, and they didn't like it. It was a simple land or boundary dispute. I mean, these are nothing new. They've been uh, part of life forever. And I don't know if you saw in the news this week the story of a couple who'd taken a boundary dispute into their own hands. They'd been frustrated by a neighbor's tree that had been overhanging their driveway, and pigeons had come and Uh, nested in the branches and pooed all over their driveway. And this had been going on for a year, and these people were fed up with it. And so they took the matter into their own hands. And here's a picture of of what they decided to do. They literally took a chainsaw straight up the middle of the tree and said, that's it. We're not having this tree hanging over our land anymore. (laughs) Maybe, Maybe a little extreme. But these things happen. Uh, the Amalekites' dispute with Israel was was not about 
you know, trees overhanging land or where the pigeons were pooing. Actually, it was significantly more serious. If you were a tribe that lived in a desert region, your life, the life of your family, the life of your livestock, and flocks completely depended on water. And the Israelites were camped by water. And so the Amalekites really had a genuine uh, desire to take the land that the Israelites were on. Uh, they were intent on taking it from them. And so for the first time in their journey, the Israelites are faced with combat. Remember that when they, uh, when they came out of Egypt, they came through the Red Sea, and although the Egyptians were defeated, it was entirely big by God's hand. None of the Israelites actually needed to enter into combat at all. What we're going to see here is how the Israelites face this first threat of physical attack. And as we see in the story, their victory is not won on the battlefield, physically with a sword, but on the hillside in a spiritual battlefield. As Joshua leads out an untrained, probably unprepared band of men to fight the Amalekites in the valley, Moses takes up the fight in prayer on the mountaintop. And I'm going to bring to us three things that I think this story uh, can teach us this morning. They are these. First of all, that we need to learn to fight in two places. Secondly, that we need to fight alongside friends. And thirdly, that we will win on the mountain. So first of all, what does it mean for us to fight in two places? Well, I think I first perhaps became aware of this reality of a fight in two places when actually I was at school. Probably I was about uh, nine or ten at the time. And I was uh, attending the King's School in Oxfordshire. It had been established by our group of churches. It was an independent Christian school. And in the first uh, few years of the school's life, we were based in a very large old farmhouse in the middle of uh, a housing estate in Whitney. The house had been owned by some of the church members. Church had gathered there to worship, and now this house was going to be used as a school. And actually, it was great. That was, uh, uh, you know, a great environment to be in. We went to this great farmhouse kitchen to do our cookery classes. We had a little funny, you know, setup of a science lab in, in one room, assemblies around the fireplace in the big lounge. Uh, that was the context of the first couple of years of this school's life. But the establishment of a school in the middle of this housing estate didn't go down with all of, uh, well with all of the neighbours. They would obviously complain about the noise that we would make at break time and lunchtime. They'd complain about the traffic uh, and all of that. And in, uh, at one point, this things got to the point where the local council actually put a stop order on the school. So the, you can't carry on in this building. You can't carry on to operating. You're going to have to find somewhere else. And actually, that led to a few years of the school being quite nomadic. We ended up being uh, in some scout hut somewhere and some temporary building somewhere. But at the um, beginning of one particular school year, the first day of term, uh, I went to the Cotswold Wildlife Park, which was eight miles down the road. Uh, great place to have a school day, wonderful adventure playground for break time. But our classroom that day was in the attic space above the reptile house. I don't know if any of you, any of you can compete with a, with a school uh, story like that. But yeah, this is where we had our school day at the beginning of the school year. Uh, I seem to remember perhaps the highlight of the day, other than the adventure playground, uh, was partway through the morning where, uh, when a, a guy came up the stairs with this huge sack, opened a big hatch and started dropping meat into the crocodiles because uh, it was their feeding time. Uh, this was the school day, and, uh, you know, I, uh, the older I am and the wiser I am now, the more I sympathise with the teachers who had to make something of that. Um, but you can imagine, uh, our day was not the day we expected. The lessons were not as they might have been planned. And prayer became a really significant part of our day. However old we were, whatever stage of faith, we could engage in prayer that God was going to sort out our situation, that we would be able to return to the building that we, uh, that we were meant to be in. Actually, we were there for one day, because in the middle of the afternoon, I remember a head teacher coming in and shouting, we've won. We've won the victory. Our prayers have been answered. Actually, 
that had been the main weapon. It had been prayer. We didn't really have much of an argument against the council, but for some reason, they conceded. Our prayers had been answered, and we were able to return. I'd learned a really significant lesson in this, uh, in this day, that our battles were not just to be fought practically or physically, but they were to be fought and ultimately to be won spiritually. And in this story, those uh, places are illustrated by a physical battle in a valley and a spiritual battle on a mountain. As Joshua leads his army into conflict, Moses took the fight in prayer onto the hillside. So how do we respond when challenges come into our lives? Uh, For many of us, actually, our first instinct is very practical. We rush to sort out whatever the problem is. We go and fix things. When other people find themselves in difficulty, we rally around, we help out, we do what we can. And actually, they're great responses because they express something of the love and compassion of God as we seek to support one another. But I suppose the question is, how many times do we keep that fight in the valley? Do we limit our fight to our natural resources, our practical and physical capacity? And do we neglect to engage in prayer? Do we neglect to engage the power of God through prayer on the mountain? You know, I find that a challenge. I can be far quicker to think practically and often too slow to think prayerfully. Uh, Let me give you a little small example just from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Two weeks ago on uh, Sunday morning, Anna and I were leading the service, and for those of you who are here, you'll know we started slightly late. For those of you who are watching, or at least trying to watch online, you'll know that the live stream didn't quite work as it should do that morning. And at 5 to 11, uh, it was not panic, but a little alarm uh, as to what we were going to do. And my instinct was to rush to the back. I was going to help, I was going to sort this out. And as we were sorting things out of the back, Anna appeared at the front and said, shall we pray about this? And led everybody who was sat here in front of them in prayer. And at five past 11, we were able to get the stream working. Two different responses to the same problem, but they just illustrate. Actually, do you know what? Often we can rush into the practicalities, which needed to be sorted out. But often, so often the fight is won in prayer as well. We need to learn to fight in two places, but actually also very significantly in this story, there's something to teach us about fighting alongside friends. You know, we often focus on two individuals in this story, Joshua and Moses. Joshua in the valley and Moses on the hillside, but of course, neither of them were alone. Joshua was leading his army into battle and Moses had Aaron and her with him. And in both cases, having people alongside meant the difference between victory and defeat. For Joshua to have fought the Amalekites on his own would have just been ridiculous. No one would have even contemplated that being a good idea. But Moses also recognised the need for support in his prayer battle. As Moses stood on the hillside with his hands raised in prayer, this became a visible symbol to him and to Aaron and her, and probably to Joshua and some of the army as well, of the spiritual battle that was going on. We read in the story that actually this is not, a, this is not an easy pose to keep up for a long while. I'm not, I'm not going to last very long. And I'm probably not going to find an Aaron and her who can come and socially distance and hold my arms up. This becomes tiring, and that's what Moses found. And actually, as his arms were raised, he could see a victory being won in the valley. And as he tired and his arms started to drop, he could see uh, the Amalekites starting to win the battle. And so the battle for him was, am I going to keep this prayer fight going? It became a physical task for him. It became a task of perseverance and persistence. But he was not alone. The story tells us that, first of all, Aaron and her, they find this stone and they move it under Moses so he can at least sit down. But then they end up standing one holding up one hand, one holding up the other, saying, Moses, you're not going to fight this battle alone. We're standing with you in prayer. And so although Moses could see the impact of his 
prayer, it cost him in persistence to see it through to the end. It was tiring for him, but he found friends to support him. Neither Moses nor Joshua could fight alone. And it's no mistake that God places us as Christians into a church family. You know, we're not meant to walk our journeys of faith alone. It's a key reason why we encourage people in this church to be part of community groups, because it puts you into a community where you can not only enjoy one another's company, but you can fight battles together. You know, when we're with, whether we are fighting in the valley or up on the mountain, we never need fight alone. What a great company of people we find ourselves amongst. And it's wonderful uh, as a leader just to see how quickly people rally round when others find themselves in times of battle. We see practical support rolled out in the valley, meals being cooked, children being cared for, financial gifts, practical support, just being there. These are all part of fighting alongside one another in the valley. But also we see spiritual support. I don't know how many WhatsApp groups you're in, but the number of pings we get each day of, can we pray for this, pray for this, pray for this? And the response is, yes, we're praying. And I'm sure that's the same in in your community groups. Word spreads quickly when someone needs supporting in prayer. The WhatsApp group pings and the hands go up to heaven. How quickly people respond in battle by fighting for one another on the mountain. You know, this is just a key part of being in God's family. We had a, a very significant situation that required that prayer support when we were moving up here. Uh, actually, it's nearly three years since we, since we moved. And when, uh, I remember when we were first invited to move. I mean, as much as there was a surprise of an invitation because it really had come quite out of the blue... The thought of moving from where we were in Oxfordshire to Teesside, for me, actually, the, the biggest impact was as a father, thinking, can, is this the right thing for us to do for our children? Uh, Joe was, uh, if, he was coming towards the start of his GCSEs. Emma is uh, just a year behind him. Obviously, they had strong, established friendship groups. And so, th- really, the question of, whether we should move and my prayers to God were really about, well, Lord, is this going to be okay for the kids? And, and actually, as, as we prayed, Anna and I both felt, actually, this is not just going to be okay for the kids. This is going to be good for them. It's going to be something, that's, something that they're going to prosper in. Um, now, really, the practicalities about us moving for them really revolved around which school they were going to go to. We were going to be moving into this area, into Eagles Cliff, and so we were looking to get them into Eagles Cliff School down the road um, for a number of reasons. I mean, curriculum reasons, for GCSEs, lots of, lots of different reasons that made that a compelling choice for us. And when we visited, uh, the school were really quite optimistic about Joe being able to go into year 10, start his GCSEs. There, were, there was, there was going to be space available. They were quite confident about that. For Emma getting into year 9, that was going to be more difficult. The, the year group was already oversubscribed. They would need to see a number of children moving on, even to create space. Um, so they couldn't be at all uh, committed in any response there. But, of course, we submitted our applications. And when it came to it, neither of them were offered a place there. They were offered places in good schools, but completely different places. And really what we would, you know, it's very different... Now we live here and we understand where things are, but we were 200 miles away and we're thinking, how's this going to work practically? We've got to get one of them here, one of them there. This school doesn't do the languages that Emma wants to do. And and what do we do? But you have to to accept something that you've been offered, don't you? So so we had no choice but to accept um, places that we were offered and then to lodge an appeal. Um, This was a little stressful, uh, particularly as we were just really keen that this, that this move was good for our kids. We were still 200 miles away and, of course, trying to do everything by email and phone. And we were fighting a battle in a valley. That's what it felt like. And so what we needed was the support of people alongside us, friends praying in Oxfordshire. There were people praying here that, uh, that actually, whatever the outcome, that there would be a good outcome for the kids. And... 
as it came towards the end of the summer term, we were, we were still in Oxfordshire, we hadn't moved. Well, we had a small breakthrough as actually Joe was given a place at Egglescliffe School and there was hope that Emma would be too. So uh, what we did was we had to continue with submitting an appeal for her. We had to go through that process. We were prepared for that. And, um, and we got to the end of the summer term ready to come up and present um, our appeal when we got a message saying, it's okay, this doesn't need to happen, uh, it'll be okay, we, we've found a space for her, you don't need to come and attend this appeal. And we just felt this weight lifting from us. We'd reached the end of the academic year, we were going to be moving in August, I was starting work here in September, obviously the kids were starting their school year, and ah, and we went on holiday and we just relaxed <laughs> and we moved and we enjoyed the experience of just settling in, meeting people. And it got to the end of August and, you know, Joe had already uh, signed up his place. We just had to go and fill in the paperwork and get Emma sorted out. We just needed to make a couple of phone calls and that was okay, which of course we did. So we, we phoned up and we said, right, we, as you said, at the end of the summer term, we're going to sort Emma's place out. And the person at the other end of the phone said, I'm really sorry, you should never have been told that. <laughs> um, there's, there's no place for her. And actually what the person uh, had done previously was not only tell us that she had a place at Ailscliff, They'd also withdrawn her from her place at another school. So actually she had no school place whatsoever. And so on the first day of the school year, Joe set off to school, walked down the road, and Emma was at home with us, not on any school role whatsoever. We were once again in a battle. And uh, by this point, actually, we're getting pretty good at writing appeals, <laughs> you know, thinking, do you know what? I think we've got a good argument here. This feels quite, you know, we're, we're thinking, well, we're up for this fight, but we're going to need to get some prayer support as well. And again, texts, prayers, lots of people here praying, lots of people in Oxfordshire praying for us. But we were warming up for an appeal. I went, <laughs> even just reminded myself of this story yesterday. We had a huge timeline of how this had worked out. It just was a really good reminder to me of how it worked. We had letters written. We had all kinds of evidence to support us. And it came to the point at which we submitted our appeal. We'd done that. I phoned up uh, the next day. I just, I just need to know that you've received this. Is this going to happen? She said, yep, we've received your appeal. But listen, we don't need to hear it. A place has become available. A place has been like, I don't know how that happened. Uh, she said, I, I don't, these things don't normally happen. Um, a couple of children have left that we didn't know about and a place has become available, and she can have a place. And once again, that sense of victory. But this time, not even though we were warming up for a fight, the battle had been won on the mountain. The battle had been won in prayer. God had performed the miraculous for us. And actually, our testimony uh, over these three years is not that the kids have been okay, but this has been good for them that God has been faithful to his promise um, and uh, that when he, when he fights for us, actually, his purposes are one. When we fight in the valley, we need friends alongside us who know how to help. But how much more important for us are those friends who are fighting on the mountain alongside us in prayer? You know, we have to fight in two places. We have to learn to fight with friends do you know what? We find that we win when we're on the mountain. It's clear that in this story of the Israelite battle, victory came not through the might of Joshua and his army, but through Moses' persistent engagement in prayer. And so significant is this victory that it's recorded for generations to come. Moses established an altar there. He said, I'm going to name this altar, the Lord is my banner. You know, he is the banner we are fighting under. He's the commander of this army and the victory is his. God also tells Moses to write down this story of the battle on a scroll and make sure that Joshua has heard the account. You know, these were significant instructions. 
You know, firstly, recording something on a scroll was not as straightforward as we might imagine. They were still in the desert. There was no corner shop that they were going to nip down to to find a nice little bit of parchment. Parchment itself was really expensive, and so actually acquiring it, creating the scroll, was an expensive and special task. But this was an event that was so important that God intended it to be remembered for generations to come. And secondly, Joshua was going to be the leader who would follow Moses. It was him who would lead the Israelites into the promised land. And so God was very deliberate in instructing Moses to make sure that he understood the way in which this victory had been won. Joshua needed to understand that when he was leading, and that he was going to face battles, and they were going to be fought and won in the spiritual realms and not just through physical effort. You know, it's a lesson for us today. The people of God, we're not immune from the battles of life. Many of you at the moment will feel like you're right in the middle of a valley at the moment. Some of you, I know, are battling significant health challenges. You know, you're finding yourselves in work or financial difficulties. Wasn't it encouraging to hear those stories this morning of God answering prayers? For others of you, maybe you're just finding yourselves in the middle of real relational turmoil, whether that's with friends or with family. You know, these are the very real battles of life. And as Christians, we're we're certainly not immune from them. But what is different for us as the people of God is that we can fight differently. We don't fight alone. We don't fight just from our own resources. But we fight with people around us and we fight with the resources of heaven. We can go up the mountain. We can lift our hands high in prayer And we can access the power of heaven. And you know what? That's when we see the miraculous. These stories we heard this morning, the stories I've told you this morning, they're stories of the miraculous. They're stories where people don't understand why, but the outcome has been victorious. We see stories of impossible healing. We see stories of remarkable provision. We see stories of incredible reconciliation, answers to prayer that are far beyond our effort and resources in the valley. You know, and as I come to a finish, and I'm going to hand back to Ray and Silver in a moment, I want to encourage you this morning. Whatever battle you're fighting in this morning, don't feel like you need to fight it alone. Find friends around you. Fight in two places. Take that battle up the mountain. Fight with friends alongside you, and let's see the victory of God won. And I want to just put up the slide that was shown earlier. Um, that uh, was about us telling our story. Do you know what? We want to be a church that keeps telling the story of God's miraculous power. And so when you win a victory, will you tell the story? We'd love to fill social media and our website and our YouTube channel and our Sunday mornings with the stories of what God is doing amongst us because they're the stories that bring the glory to him. You know, they're not just little things that happen in our lives that we can take for granted. These are great things that we should be celebrating week after week after week because God is doing an abundance amongst us. And I just want to encourage you, if you've got a story, even this morning, go to the website. Go to that stories website. Click on the button that says tell your story. And will you share it with us so that we give the glory to God? I'm going to hand back to Ray and Sylvia now because I think they're going to close and lead us in some prayer this morning. And if you're facing a battle this morning, will you bring it to the Lord this morning with fresh faith that there's victory for you as you lift your hands in prayer? So, guys.